Again, I'm dope. This is what's left in talk about eight plates. Right? Um, I tried to explain the basic idea in the words that came out the screen before we started. Um, I don't know if this is important or not. I think it's interesting, especially with uh, our current uh, crisis in the country. And um, often, as we as it ended into this crisis at the beginning of the year, um, I was reminded a lot of those early days of the AIDS crisis and um, all the things that occurred, all the thoughts and feelings that, that whirled through us in the gay community and um, eventually in the wider world. Um, so, um, I'm going to bring you all on. Let's just come on the screen and we'll, we'll, I'll introduce my uh, panel for tonight. And there they all are. As I introduce you, um, if you would maybe just say a word or two, uh, not a word or two, talk for a minute or two about your um, initial uh, thoughts and feelings when I proposed this idea to you, which I basically the words I put on the screen or the words I shared with you. And I want to start with John Hogan. Um, who's my friend from way, way back. Um, and he directed me in an AIDS play, actually, as is. That's kind of how we got to know each other at LCC. Um, at the same time, there was a production at MSU of The Normal Heart going on. Um, it was kind of fun because people would come from uh, seeing that one to seeing our play because they were on at the same time and say things like, I like this better because it's not as angry as the other one. Um, <laughs> and things like that. Um, Barry Kramer, angry. <laughs> uh, those were the days. Um, John, uh, you and I have talked about this idea for a long, long time. What are your thoughts? Well, when you first suggested... Can you hear you, John? Um, I don't know why. I'm unmuted. Can you hear me now? Some adjusting there. We were having a hard time hearing you earlier, so... Can others be heard? I can, can hear you. Say I can hear John. I, John I can, can you hear me, Doug? Can nobody hear me? We, we can, can hear, hear you. you. It's tinny, but we I can hear you. <laughs> now no. no. no, I can hear you. <laughs> well, you sound much better, too. <laughs> it's amazing what happens when you put on your ears. So probably nobody heard what I just said. Oh, well, anyway, it doesn't matter. This is all homemade, so we don't really care. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Hogan, yeah. um, I'm sorry, you probably already said a bunch of stuff, but could you? I didn't, I didn't say anything. Okay. okay. I, I, all I started with was when you, you know, sent the email out and we started talking about it again 30 years later. Uh, like everyone, I'm sure, it, it kind of occurred to me that it is interesting to talk about this during the pandemic, um, the COVID pandemic. But what struck me today when I was thinking about it more is how really it's very, very different. Um, because then there was not a sense of we're all in this together. Um, right. It was very much you, we were alone. And there was sort of this, you know, theater group and there was this gay group and there was this little kind of like a Venn diagram, a very small overlap in the middle. And that's where I found myself. And coincidentally, that's where I found you too. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but to me, it was a very lonely place. And it was not surprising that you and I would have a lot of conversations and see within other plays that weren't AIDS plays, um, you know, like Into the Woods is the example we used to talk about, that we saw those as AIDS plays because that was just the lens through which we saw everything at that time. Yeah. It was so overwhelming. Um, and I also thought a bit today about that just that idea that, you know, does it matter whether a playwright has put it in? You know, and I used to teach dramatic theory and criticism and I had to free up young students to say, you know, it's not a, there's not a key to finding the answer to this play. It doesn't matter whether the playwright put it in there or not. If it's there for you, it's there. Hmm. You know, the thing that you bring to the play is you, yourself, your whole self when you sit down in an audience. And um, so I think uh, that's what I was wrestling with today is does it matter whether the playwright meant it to be about AIDS or not? Um, mm -hmm. Certainly some plays are, you know, that way. The other thing that I was thinking about a bit today was how AIDS plays changed the gay theater overall because before that, g the gay was the problem. You know, you were... <laughs> Uh, you know, you were had to come out, or you had you were you had self-loathing because you were gay or whatever. And then when AIDS plays came along, gay plays took on much more universal themes. They were sort of allowed to um, because the gay wasn't the problem, mm -hmm. um, and the rest of the world. And and I think it really changed the way people um, approached them and how they were written, but certainly how audiences saw them. Yeah, thank you. Great start, um, uh, Janet. Let me go to you next. Janet is, uh, um, she just moved to Detroit from the Lansing area, right? Yeah. With, just with your, your husband, Mark Coulson. And um, yes. you just recently earned your MFA last spring, I think, from Goddard College. Mm -hmm. Correct. And you also, you are an actress and a playwright and a director, I think. And you've uh, just recently at Riverwalk, your play that you did as your, your MFA, I think, final thing on a project um ea it's called and you had that read on line for as part of the riverwalk season yeah eaters so, anonymous EA. So, yeah welcome janet what, what was on your mind oh gosh so i love the title of the podcast and i'm, mm -hmm. I'm pretty agreeable so it's like of course every plays in a play <laughs> you know and um then I, I started to think about well because one of the first things I thought of is every song's a love song is one of the things I always tell my kids. Mm. They, my girls sing. And um, you can't find a song that's not about love because if it isn't, it's not a song. That's just, I, I feel like that's like factual. Mm. So, um, uh, so I feel like saying that every AIDS is an AIDS play might not be accurate, but I kind of tapped into that idea of the, the kind of looking at things more holistically and that um, kind of like what John was saying, as far as you bring yourself to it. So, and you bring your time to it. Um, every play is a reflection of what time we are in and what resonates with us. So um, I, f I feel like there is a lot of resonance um, between uh, now and um, AIDS coming on the scene, I, I, I have felt that, but in a different way. I found this experience for me has been very isolating in a way that um, uh, the AIDS epidemic wasn't. Mm -hmm. um, but th there was something else that it made me think of, oh, that, that I say with plays, I don't think that every play is a love play, um, but I think that every play is political and every play is sociopolitical, even if it's like, like self-consciously not, even if it's like, princesses and unicorns it's like oh that's very political so um inadvertently or overtly like it's it's this every play is a commentary in the times and um so that's that's what it said to me that title is and also we see what we're um we see what we're looking for and when something we don't always know why something resonates with us but um when it does, it can also provoke a conversation about those issues that that are so important. And um, I think this is a perfect time to talk about those because everything's broken down and we can only talk about, you know, we can really only talk to people like in Zoom meetings. It's also weird. So why not talk about things that are really important to us? Yeah. Thank you, Because we're not doing theater, so we can talk about it. Exactly. <laughs> 
Um, I'm going to say this now because I want to say it sometime, and I just you just reminded me of it. One 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 sort of key to the universality of this to me is that when I went to as we were starting the Lansing Area AIDS Network back in 1985, um, I went through a buddy program in Detroit and you know, two day kind of thing. And there was a, a nun or a nurse, or maybe she was a nurse and a nun, I don't know, but who said something uh, uh, to us that I've, I've always held on to. She said, we are all dying from a, an incurable, um, fatal, sexually transmitted disease called life. It's kind of fun. Anyway, yeah. Todd, uh, Todd, you are an activist and a journalist in the Lansing area uh, in Michigan. Um, you've had some work on the, the national stage as well as a, um, someone who talks a lot about HIV and the law. And um, you're also an actor and a director locally and everybody around here knows you. And uh, what, what came to your mind? So, um, first of all, thank you for hosting this. Um, you know, we're having this conversation just a week before World AIDS Day. So mm -hmm. I think it's important to remember that, um, which didn't exist when these first plays were, were produced and created. And so thank you for hosting this to start with. But I think that the first thing that I came, came to, and I think I actually emailed this was, well, are we also going to call every you know, Shakespeare play, uh, uh, a plague play, because, you know, the Black Death was going through at the time. It, it, but as, as I thought about it and have dug around on it, I think that we do bring a lens to it, obviously. And that includes the writer, that includes the director, that includes, you know, the actors. It, I don't think we get to define what is and isn't an AIDS play because we're still in the middle of the pandemic. It's mm -hmm. still happening. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have we have these horrifying statistics with with African American men who have sex with men, where fifty percent of the the twenty year olds are going to be infected with HIV by the time they're fifty. Yeah, that's horrifying. So we have no idea what what those stories are going to come in the, in the next two, three, four, five decades. Yeah. As, as we move forward. So I don't think we get to define what is and isn't an AIDS play. I think that's going to be some future historian <laughs> who's going to look back at it and go, well, that was clearly an AIDS play that into the woods yeah. thing. But they'll be interested in what we thought we were doing. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And I think that it's interesting. It's important that um, well, as you say that about what's happening in the world right now, it is so not in the public consciousness in this country that that's going on. Even though there is a World AIDS Day, it's not really that talked about. We don't even think about it much. Good, thank you, Todd. Um, and let's move on to Melissa, um, who I, who, who, what is your official job at LCC now? Academic and Arts Outreach Coordinator. Okay, anyway, she's a lovely person, a wonderful person to talk to about anything. Um, I've, over the years, talked, had many, many really good conversations with you. One of the reasons I wanted you to get in this, whether you had an interest or not, I wanted to just hear what you'd have to say. Um, and uh, so, so what came to your mind, Melissa, when I brought this to you? Well, several things, and we talked about some of them, but first, I think... I'm just thinking maybe we first met through LAN, through Lansing Area AIDS Network. Really? Because I oh. was a volunteer. In, oh. I volunteered in the early, early, it was probably mid 80s because I was working for Boar's Head then. Uh -huh. um, anyway, maybe. That, that, that could be, that could be yeah. the place that just, just yeah. rang a bell. Um, so I have no idea the answer to this question. And as I, I told you when we chatted about it a little bit, that, that my first, my first thought is like, hmm, is that possible? How can that be? Um, and, and if we're going to say that about every play, are there other things we can say about every play? So I was kind of curious about that. Mm -hmm. um, but I also, I also thought, because you were looking at bringing people together who are directors, that, that not being a director, I don't, I don't know the books of all those plays. I don't uh, analyze plays as a director, an actor, uh, or a writer would. I, but I am 
an avid audience member. And so I think was it you, John, who said, and Janet, you reiterated about bringing your whole self. And that's, that is how I um, take in a play. So um, I thought, well, and from that perspective, uh, you know, I can, can share my thoughts as yeah. we, as we go along. And um, I also very much the parallel between the pandemic and uh, this pandemic and AIDS, though that impacted initially a specific group, gay men, it did, it, it did go beyond that oh, yeah. too. And the, the, you know, I think there's many parallels, the, the idea of, of, you know, the, the, uh, how transmittable is it and who has it and what's the time period and when how did they get it? Yeah. When yeah. did you get it? And when do you stop worrying and all the, uh, or, or not, um, you know, we're, fortunately there are things that are, 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 you know, helping people now. Um, you know, it's advanced. The other thing too, is that just Dr. Fauci, Dr. Fauci, then Dr. Fauci now, mm -hmm. I mean, there's just, just some things there that are, that are, uh, that have nothing to do with theater, but that, that, you know, I've been thinking about for a while about, um, that time and this time, and also then how do we react? And this is more of a societal thing, but it gets reflected in theater. How do we react to people who have it and, um, and why they have it and how everything becomes politicized. And shouldn't um, they have known better? <laughs> right, right. Punishing and, you know, yeah. So, yeah. so I felt like it was a very rich, rich subject from many yeah. directions. And, and uh, when you told me who all was going to be in, eager to meet your, your friend and colleague, John, and excited to see Joe and, and Todd and then Janet, so. Yeah. You're, uh, you're reminding me, I mean, I, I wrote an AIDS play uh, that was done at LCC, part of their studio theater uh, called My Shape Accidental, which was based on a story I wrote. And it's funny, in the re in the workshopping of that and then the, the working of it, a big thing in a lot of the actors' minds was, well, how did he get it? How did he get the AIDS? Who gave it to him? You know, it's like all that. That was kind of the, it's almost like a soap opera plot kind of like yeah. approach to the whole thing. And, and um and I, of course, what I was trying to do was get inside the mind of someone who would be coming back home with the illness and dealing with uh, his friends and family from that point of view. Um, thank you for that memory, Lane. Uh, Trip and Joe, quick. You just hey. did recently, one of your last things in Lansing was uh, Falsettos. You played Wizard. Um, and it was a great production. Um, what came to your mind? Um, you are now in uh, Dallas, right? In yes. Texas. We miss yep. you. Um, so, what's in your mind, Joe? So, honestly, when you when you first posed the topic, I um, I immediately went to this could be kind of cheeky and fun, mm -hmm. and um, and and what, but then sort of sat back in something that's sort of bothered me as an actor who's done a few shows either that were, you know, gay themed or had an AIDS theme. And that's that first, you know, anytime I was playing, you know, even as a gay man, anytime I was playing a gay character, I felt like I didn't want to misrepresent the sort of full swath of community or overdo something, but also um, one of the things that I went through in doing falsettos is a sort of guilt that my generation didn't deal with the same things that your generation did, Doak. And so it kind of, so I started, I, I kind of went back to, to kind of thinking about that and recognizing that, you know, in, in my childhood, like my introduction to HIV was through Magic Johnson. Mm. And, um, and just a, a whole different orientation um, to, to that crisis and not really being aware of it until I was part of the gay community. And not, not, not aware of it. In fact, I even, I, I, I think aware of sort of raw impact of that crisis as opposed to aware of it from more of an academic perspective, even studied AIDS crisis in Africa in college, right? 
but never found any sort of personal connection or knew people who were dealing with that, that mm -hmm. crisis from the gay community. So I think that was one of the first things that sort of came to mind. But, um, but when I kind of looked at your three themes and started thinking about this current crisis as well, um, there were a lot of things that sort of rang true, especially about the um, sort of um, blaming and shame and guilt um, we just, my husband and I just had a conversation just about, um, you know, Thanksgiving weekend, right? And whether or not we were going to see anyone or expose anyone to a disease we don't, as far as we know, don't have, um, and still just the guilt of every interaction with, with other humans or, um, you know, not even so much frightened that, um, you know, that we'll get COVID-19, but that will expose someone else who has, who's, you know, more likely to be um, impacted by it. And so I think, you know, both that and, and just sort of from the, from the artist's perspective and the conversation we're having today, the fact that I feel like this is, um, like this, this time period isn't really allowing us an outlet to be who we are. Mm -hmm. um, in a lot of ways. And so I think that that has, that has kind of um, had sort of a stifling effect that I think can sometimes, or can maybe be equated to, um, you know, shame of a disease or um, shame of who you are because it's being associated with, yeah. with that. Um, I have some, I, my mind is in a certain place, but what I'd rather ask, I think first though, is if any of you want to um, comment on anything anybody else has said um, or, or have a new thought based on what someone else said. If I could, I'd, I'd like to tag on, John, you talked a little bit about how the, the, the AIDS plays sort of led to some deeper exploration of uh, queer humanity. And, and I kind of want to challenge that a little bit because we still see almost every major depiction of queer folks being, and then they died, right? Brokeback Mountain. Oh, look, they're in love. Isn't that wonderful? Oh, he's dead. Um, you know, we don't have the great queer love story. What we have is the great queer tragedy. And the AIDS <laughs> epidemic was comforting and, and sort of hoity-toity for a lot of people who were anti-gay because they could have sort of, I think a sick, twisted feeling of glee watching people that they didn't like suffer. Hmm. It was a new way of suffering, which is why I think it's important to recognize that the first play about AIDS that played in New York City was Robert Chesney's uh, uh, play, um, Night Sweat, which was about a sex club that doubled as a assisted suicide program. Mm. You Don't got to design one. your own fantastical suicide and it was a farcical comedy. Mm. That was in 1984. And I think that that shows that even with it in this, this larger subsection, we, we forget sometimes that the queer community has this deep, deep, deep response to trauma of humor, of finding the humor, of mining the humor. And it's Joe, you went to that. Um, so I think, I think in some ways we have been delegitimized. We still aren't full human beings, but on the other hand, our humor is a great gift to the world. And I think that the, the AIDS genre, if you will, has helped sort of open that up a little bit. Mm -hmm. Todd, you said something, and this isn't necessarily about every play being an AIDS play, but but you said that you don't that there isn't the great gay love story play, and here's where you know I don't. There's tons and tons of plays, and I'm just racking my brain. There isn't one. There isn't one that that doesn't end up in death. Yeah, I, I think the closest, for me at least, the closest that I can think of is Beautiful Thing. And, and I remember actually going to see that the summer that my partner David died from AIDS. And I just remember walking out of the theater every night. Like, I went and saw it every night at the Odeon. The entire week that it was there. 
because it just lifted my spirits so much because the two gay kids were allowed to, oh my God, be in love. Nobody died. <laughs> nobody, you know, nobody got thrown out of their homes. They were just happy. Well, there's also, I mean, another thing to think, I mean, in a way, in every love story ends in death, <laughs> you can go there as well. Um, just like I think everybody, every play is in some way about coming out of closets. Um, every play is about dealing with survival. Um, that, that's why I think it's kind of universal. John, you look like you're going to say something. Well, I think every, I think every play is about learning or failing to learn. Someone mm. learns or they don't learn. Um, and, the, you know, the, to call it out, I think, um, you're right. I mean, there are a lot of plays where it re that reflect the reality that you were living at that time, it sounds like, where your lover died. And to put that on stage, I think, was a very important thing for the gay community. You also have to kind of divide things. There were plays that were written specifically for gay people, not just a straight audience. Chesley's are a great example of that. You know, the uh, his plays came along when he was aware that the the um, community was a little further along. Um, you know, than the country as a whole. That the gay community was in a different place, and we're ready to laugh at things, and we're ready to you know wrestle with some of these larger issues. I think. Um, also, I, it was interesting because I think there is a real difference between some of the work that I was lucky enough to get a chance to do, which was specifically in a gay theater for a gay audience for, you know, here in San Francisco. It's the Rhino, right? Yeah. yeah. So it was, a, it was a lot different. You know, I heard, um, this may or may not tie in neatly, but this morning I heard uh, uh, Kamala Harris being interviewed and she told this very interesting story about, well, she was a very bright, obviously, college, or a college bound high school girl. And one of the guidance counselors, um, she said that she wanted to go to, you know, a historically black college. And one of the guidance counselors said, why would you want to go where everyone thinks the same way you do? And it occurred to me, like in, especially around this conversation, that's why I left Lansing and came to San Francisco at the darkest time for this city was it was important to me to be around my people and who I knew I wasn't going to be the only one going through this. And I knew there was a theater happening here that I could be a part of. And it wasn't for other audiences. You know, I, I really, there was a long period where it was important to do plays for my community um, and with my community, um, which, were, which were very different than I think some of the plays that come along later really had to do. So I guess maybe I'm focusing a little bit on the earlier chapters because um, because of that. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if that... Yeah, yeah. I wonder, I wonder too, when you think about, um, I, I, you know, I think, I think these comments are interesting because I think about how we now see reflections of um, happy LGBT couples on television mm -hmm. and in other, so, like I look down at my Dan Levy mug, right? <laughs> Great example. But I think you know, and even if it's sort of farcical or, um, you know, there's some stereotypes played up, it's sort of out of joy. And I, and I don't think, besides the fact that, you know, gay characters in mu newer musicals are normalized or, you know, um, um, just sort of always present, it seems now in, in newer um, musical theater. But, um, you know, I wonder, I wonder why that is. I, I wonder if it's, you know, a lot of the... Um, more um, serious um, emotional um, stage plays, straight plays, straight plays, um, are, uh, are, are written by um, people who, um, you know, experience some of that trauma themselves as opposed to, um, you know, what, what might be, you know, written for television now, or I, I don't know why that is. Yeah, do you have a thought? I, well, I do have thought because, you know, and, and I don't know, this kind of gets it, this is sort of a playwright kind of centric question, but about like what we're writing. And, you know, there's a certain thing, write what you know, and there's a certain thing, like, I, I don't know if people would have a problem. I, I'm writing a play right now that I guess could be an AIDS play kind of by your criteria, <laughs> but in a gay play, you know, and should, um, 
should somebody who identifies as straight be writing, you know, a gay play, you know? And I think that um, I don't feel like I should, I, I, I feel like art is also a way to explore trying to get into somebody else's shoes and reflecting the experience around me that I think is important in the stories I want to tell too. So it's just interesting, you know, you talk about, um, you know, gay plays or AIDS plays, you talk about black plays, you talk about, you know, the, the theater of representation. And I think that black writers should be able to write, they shouldn't have to feel like they have to write plays that are just about black people. Just yeah. like, I don't feel like I should have to write plays that are just about um, white women um, or straight women. Janet, what's the impulse, um, your creative impulse, um, to take you in that direction toward that that subject and that 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 uh, framework for? I think what? you might have nailed it. Every play is about coming out of the closet in some mm. way, and the name of the play is like sounds very uncreative right now. It's called Coming Out Inside, mm -hmm. and it was, um, it was actually because uh, I was talking to an LCC student and I was going to write him a, uh, a monologue. And then I just decided, and, and he, he said, well, you're a writer, can you write me a monologue about coming out? And I, said, <laughs> um, and I was thinking about writing a monologue about coming out, but it didn't come out as a monologue, it came out as a play. And then of course his character, like in this play, um, it's, it's during the quarantine. So actually nobody really cares about him coming out. They're more worried about the quarantine and they're all inside anybody, what way. And they, they like, he want like, like coming out, he wanted it to be this big, important experience, you know? Like coming out to his family and they um, are pretty oblivious. It's so but, interesting. Just the fact that he asked you to write the monologue for him is interesting, I think. I like to, I like to think he used it at Thanksgiving dinner. Oh. <laughs> I never gave it to him. There's the cliche for us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't put that in a place. Too. I, I never gave it to him. <laughs> COVID shut everything down. I, uh -huh. It, it, yeah, but but it got your juices flowing to, to think about that. That's it a, did, and then I I was thinking, well, you know, not like ever, not like every play is a quarantine play, but every play for me right now is. Yeah, yeah, I think that's an important <laughs> point. Yeah, even if I wrote about, you know, I was thinking about like they want stuff in the hopper for TV, and not like I'm a TV writer yet. But I was like, how can I write a play about people without face masks on? <laughs> you know, and how could I expect them to do it safely? Like, I, I don't know. It's, it's just, I, I feel like every, there's a lot of obstacles right now. Yeah, and, 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 and uh, dualities. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of things that are both true at the same time, even though they seem contradictory. Like, and as and a writer, I, I think as a writer, that's important, but also to remember, you know, the audience always gets the last word. And when they arrive, they can't not be who they are. Hmm. You can't not do that. So if you were to do um, Into the Woods today and cast a Chinese American actress as the witch and everyone starts saying, you're the one to blame, we can't not <laughs> see. Um, you know, if you watch Company, I was told I was required to get Company into the conversation to win a prize. <laughs> So, so if you watch Company, uh, production on PBS with Neil Patrick Harris as Bobby, you can't not know who he ah. is. Yeah, that's true. And so what you bring to it, you know, is is critical, I think. Or, you know, it, it, we just can't not be ourselves. And I, I, I'm sure it's difficult for writers, you know, and... and all the, you know, when you talk about, you know, Joe talked about representing all of the community or you, you know, crossing over and writing about other people. And, you know, I, I, I don't claim to be able to talk about or represent an LGBT community because I'm only one of those things. Mm -hmm. And so, but I am, every time I go into the audience, I'm all, always fully me, uh, or if I'm acting or if I'm directing. So I think, a couple of parallels that I think are really interesting is that, you know, let's think for a minute, Janet, about sort of our first experience together, which was Dyer of Anne Frank, right? Which, you know, Anne Frank wrote this, these beautiful entries about the outside world that she had no contact with. So is that play a quarantine play? 
or her diary, a quarantine diary, or is it the diary of a fully realized human being? And I think that that's the difference when we start talking about creating these really niche ideas is, are we creating a niche because we, we want to be on the edge? We want to, we want to tell the new queer story. We want to, you know, to tell the, be the first to tell the COVID-19 story in a new way? Or are we telling it because it grows out of a human experience? The latter, the latter for sure. I, th I think that, um, I mean, it's obviously the, the title's facetious in the sense that we're not trying to like, create a genre and fit plays into it. The concept would be more like, um, I have a play and it resonates with me because of my experience of this pandemic or that pandemic or this coming out of the closet or that coming out of the closet. Um, and so I think, I mean, we're not trying to fix things into a framework, but rather to explore what the framework might reveal, I think, in terms of universal stuff. That's, that's my idea anyway. Um, you know, one thing I'm thinking because- Melissa, let's hear from you, yeah. Yeah, um, the, the first, um, requirement that you had a terrifying existential threat to a group of people or all people. So it, it made me think about other existential threats and could plays about other existential threats be AIDS plays? Could they meet all three of those criteria? Or is it, are these in a larger sense plays about existential threats? And AIDS is one of those. I think of like uh, climate crisis and mm -hmm. um, plays which is is as a genre is a a somewhat new focus um i mean there have been plays about the environment and about ecology but but specifically about the climate crisis and, and specifically trying to move people to awareness and action i think that's that's fairly recent um and uh I'm, I'm familiar with a handful of plays that are very short, but when I think of some specific ones, um, I, I did a, uh, an event called Climate Change Theater Action a few years ago. It's part of an international um, effort every two years to produce climate themed plays, very short ones all around the world. And a bank of 50 plays was amassed by writers from around the world. And then producers who signed on could read those and choose from them and produce things. And, and one of them in, that, that was part of the, our program, um, and actually another piece that was included, had fit all three of these criteria, you know, the terrifying existential threat. And each of them, there, was, there, was, there were moments or periods of blame um, and denying that personal responsibility. And then a community formed. Um, it, it didn't always survive. So actually, maybe that's not, maybe it doesn't work. Some of well, these no, it doesn't have to survive. Yeah, that's yeah. But but in some of so okay, those plays didn't fit because <laughs> everything was gone. But well, but one of the things you said early on in 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 there was you know if it was just an ex existential play, um, would does it matter if everybody in the audience sees it the same way? If I go see the Crucible or No Exit, and if to me it's an AIDS play, isn't that what we're also talking about a bit. But to someone else, it's, it's a, a race crisis play. Or... Yeah, yeah, I can't watch falsettos without it being a very AIDS play to me, but someone else could watch it and say it's about parenting. Hmm. It's about, you know, other things. So it depends on who I am when I walk in. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, dramatic literature is, has always has a, a bit of a problem and the playwrights on the panel can probably speak you know, about this better than I could, but it's always struck me that when you ask someone what a play is about, they'll tell you the story mm. of the play, but no one does that if you ask them what a poem is about, mm. or rarely what a song is about. They'll use larger universal kind of things, and yeah, I don't know if that fits into the conversation here or ever, but that's what I was thinking about, is how it, it may be that I see almost everything, like I was saying at the beginning, you know, that because of my experience, I see things through a certain lens, just like everyone does. Right. Um, and that's what you see inside a play. Whether, you whether, ask whether, that, whether that's the topic of the yeah. play or the- Exactly, play. Yeah. exactly. And the, the whole thing of the theme, I mean, the, I, I, I really enjoy a TV show, a book, a movie, a play, whatever. Um, 
yeah, what the play is about is not the plot. It's about a theme that could be something really surprising if you get down right. into it. Right. We used to do that exercise with students where I would ask them to tell me what, after they read a play, I'd ask them to tell me what it was about, but I'd tell them three words they couldn't use. <laughs> you know, take me out, the baseball play. You know, tell me what this play is about, but you can't say gay, baseball, or player. <laughs> and then so you have to like look at what the play is underneath the surface. Nice. Um, yeah. And I don't, I think that's the opposite of what Todd was saying about pigeonholing plays and finding the play that does this, because I think plays have been written that can do, you know, that's why people return to Shakespeare and why people can watch it and see many different things within right. it. Right. Oh, Janet, you're going to say something. Yeah, yeah. Because like, um, I felt like this every play as an AIDS play was more of um, less of a pigeonhole and more of a creative exercise. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I remember I had a high school English teacher who said like this assignment, and I just, I, I don't think I was mature enough to appreciate the assignment, but compare the Declaration of Independence to Alice's Restaurant. <laughs> and I was like, that's weird. Um, but it was a creative exercise that actually, it was so open and we, we were able to come up with so much. It was so rich. And she got us to listen to a song that was important to her, you know, and, you know, it kind of worked. So to, to lay a topic, not, I'm, I'm saying lay almost sounds like force a topic, but to overlay a lens onto any play we read and say, in what way does this speak to us? You know, in the same way we're talking about yeah. um, these AIDS plays, you know, and this is not a play, it's a movie because I'm kind of, um, I like movies sometimes more than plays. Um, I, Robot is one of my favorite movies. And I think that that, like, maybe I liked your title and your criteria because one of my favorite movies meets them all. Mm. I feel like it does. Mm -hmm. Well, I think any kind of uh, exercise like you just described or John has described that, that takes you in a place you've never thought of before, you know, that's the spark to creativity and creativity is what this is all about. I mean, finding stuff that we aren't, aren't used to. Um, I think that jostling of people, I think, is one of the major points of doing theater, both from the inside and the outside coming into it to watch things. Well, I think, I think that... I, Janet, I think your your comments were interesting because it got me thinking about, you know, we talk about, you know, if, if you're thinking about it from the every, every play is an AIDS play um, lens and that resonates with you for whatever reason, that changes your experience of the play. Mm -hmm. But if you, if you are sitting next to someone who said, you know, who's thinking about it from a, this was a race play or, you know, this was a, pandemic play or whatever, that dialogue that you have with one another gets you to understand each other's experience, not only sitting in that chair, but each other's experience outside of the theater. I think that's an excellent, excellent point, that each person is having an individual experience and the fun of going to a movie or play is often talking about it afterwards, dance even more so. You know, we would go to see something without words and language and, you know, my partner and I would start talking about it afterwards and we'd seen something totally different in the yeah. piece. And we assume that since there are words involved that we're going to see the same thing. And I just don't think that's the case. Or in a, you know, in a piece of music, when that one moment in a musical, you know, that would normally just pass by becomes a long song and it gets expanded into that, you know, that moment gets expanded. You realize that the language is only part of that and the experience of it, you know, that people take away. You know, I also, now that we're talking about the title of the, you know, that Dope put out is Every Play and AIDS Play, I think it's also, you know, fair to say that in the 1980s for dope you know you could have he headlined this every play is an AIDS play for dope loss <laughs> <laughs> at that point you know everything was going through that filter hmm. that's what we talked about no matter what piece of art we saw hmm. we got back to that discussion or whatever is dominant in your life at that time yeah and so yeah. I, it may be true that these are going to be seen as pandemic plays or pandemic musicals or yeah. Uh, something else to a different to a different and as Todd said we can't predict what it will be in the future I mean that's it's going to be you know everything gets you know um, processed through whatever happens afterward and 
who knows what it'll all look like back then, but. Here we are. Should we, to, like, should we propose uh, that they call this era the pandemic era <laughs> in theater, like from <laughs> from 1980 to whenever we sort of stop these pandemics? The pandemic era. If there's anybody left to, to tell it to, I suppose. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, that was a little really? pessimistic. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I'm a pessimist, but I'm not even that pessimistic. Well, I was going to say something more positive. I was going to say, if it ever ends. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Guys, I mean, so much we get through this one, there's going to be another. I mean, this is, this is our life now, I think. But things do change a lot. I mean, you can hear that in the difference between, you know, like my comments and say Joe's comments. I mean, mm -hmm. you really hear that a generation has changed. Yeah. You know, early on in one of his comments, he said that Magic Johnson was a you know, a turn, a, a really turned a page. And when it happened, when Magic Johnson announced, you know, I went out the next day and got a t-shirt that said, my friends are magic too, because we were also upset that we had been going through this already. And then it was, so the, you know, pages do get turned and people do, you know, I am a bit of a dinosaur, you know, for having gone through certain things. Um, and that to me is, is a good thing. All right. Well, um, on that pause, I think maybe I will take the opportunity to give you the exit question on this. We never resolve anything here. That's not the point ever. Um, but just hearing you all share your feelings and your thoughts is, is really nice. And I think it'll be nice for other people as well now and maybe who knows 20 years from now. Um, uh, the, the, the question I'd like to go out on is um, so is this just an exercise, you know, uh, you know, an academic exercise, or is it? Is there actually some value to talking about this framework and this lens through which you might see a particular play or character, even? Um, and if it is, if it does have value, what is that value? That's the real question. What is that value? Okay. So I'm going to send all of you except Melissa um, off because uh, Melissa, we're going to talk about um, in this section um, uh, about something you're involved in, right? You okay. You prepared to do that, correct? You're, uh, the thing that you're doing at LCC and, and beyond, uh, just, just, just uh, you go ahead because I don't have enough information to really share it adequately um, and I want people to know about it. Sure. Um, like Every college and theater and performing group, we have been uh, working on a variety of virtual performances. And one of the things that we're doing right now that will be in two parts um, is around the theme of We Shall Overcome. And uh, it is, at, at its heart, there will be a virtual choir uh, singing that particular song. Um, that first part will uh, be released in December. And then the larger part will have a number of virtual choir pieces, as well as a variety of um, performances and talks and uh, really just a, a multi-genre exploration of that theme. And that theme, it, it hits on, uh, it is a theme for our time. It's a theme that has been for a time uh, in terms of protest and civil rights as a civil rights anthem. So it's timely in that regard now, but also in that we are dealing with a pandemic and we are dealing um, at LCC, uh, certainly for our students and our faculty, our students who, who come from many different walks of life may and have many challenges in, in moving to an online world, not because of the, you know, personal use of technology, but they may not have the technology. They may not always be in an environment where um, there's privacy, uh, where they have, you know, bandwidth or, or even, mm -hmm. you know, connection. So there, there's, there's that piece of overcoming just to learn. There's how you overcome in order to effectively teach? How do you overcome in order to connect, to stay healthy, to 
um, to improve and improve things for people? How do you overcome to experiment and invent? So it's an extremely rich subject and um, the February uh, piece or event, uh, it will be virtual, uh, but as I said, it'll have a number of choirs, choir pieces. Um, there will be uh, a poetry, uh, poetry created around that theme, community generated poetry that, that's being uh, created through uh, a variety of participants. Um, there will be uh, some, some dialogue, uh, hopefully some dance, some protest art. So it's, it's a really, um, it's a really cool, cool thing that we're putting together. Two questions. Um, is there a name to hang on this that we can sort of um, remember it by? And also, um, what are you looking for in terms of other people coming toward it and doing something that might relate to it as well? I mean, how, you, you want to do that, right? You want to build it sort of? Well, yes, we, we are building it with um, faculty and students at LCC. So it'll be okay. an LCC created. Um, but I, I, what you, what you mentioned in terms of community involvement, we are hopefully going to be opening up the virtual choir to the community. We, okay. And so um, we'll have an announcement um, probably after the first of the year. Okay about how people can participate. This, this first round, everybody's been recording themselves. They get um, a, a audio track of their part. They get the track of the whole, whole piece and they get the music and then you record yourself. Um, mm -hmm. So I did it a couple of weeks ago and sent mine in. So I'll be one of the little squares. And there's some, there's some amazing virtual choirs online um, that uh, I can't think of the, the fellow who's done a lot of the real high-end production. Thousands, thousands and thousands of participants from around the world. And mm -hmm. so it's a very, you know, very beautiful this ours will have probably a couple dozen participants for the December production, but we're hoping for more. Uh, and so I'll, I'll share that with you. Right now we're calling it, We Shall Overcome. Yeah, that sounds like a good title to, to just yeah. sort of remember it by, yeah. Said, and, and there may, I'm not sure about for this particular year, but we're already talking about doing an annual um, virtual event around a rich and broad theme that mm -hmm. can bring a variety of arts and humanities exploration of that theme together and potentially, I mean, I think it would be great to be able to connect with the community and build a series, a series of, of events or talks um, that lead, you know, to the big finale of this virtual extravaganza. Yeah. Um, so that's, we're already starting to brainstorm what we might do in for 2022. It's so nice to see you working on something like that. That's really great. Um, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of things going on. A yeah. lot of really a lot of work. Things in spite of our our little Zoom and WebEx and box yeah. world, it's not the same. Certainly, it's not the same for theater or dance or yeah. music or live performance. But but we are, you know, we are overcoming. We are yeah. making it work, and and we will see the other side of this. Great. That's that's really wonderful. I love you, Melissa. Thank you for, for sharing that. You're welcome. Thanks right. for asking. <laughs> so um, can everybody come back on? And Melissa, you had no time to think about the question, so I'm going to uh, let you go uh, toward the end rather than going first. Who'd like to start? Just your, your last thoughts on this. Mm. I'll, I'll jump in. I was going to say, Joe, I think you should. Yeah, go ahead. So I think, you know, I, I think this um, conversation is worth it. And I have to say, just like on a silly note, um, you know, it was fun um, in that uh, I spent the afternoon thinking about, you know, what what might be the, the most plotless piece of theater um, and, and trying to overlay uh, this over. And um, believe it or not, uh, the only existential crisis about cats is not that we've all been subjected to it. Um, <laughs> I start. I started kind of like you know the elements in the cats and some of the um, you know personalities and dynamics and that, which is ridiculous. No, um, the heavy also, side layer. I mean, it's very, it's very spiritual. <laughs> yes, yeah. Well, yeah. I guess. So, um, 
So, and, um, and I mean, I also went down a rabbit hole of um, is the Bible in one's place, but which is a totally different um, topic. But, um, but anyway, so I had a lot of fun with it, but I think that um, there's also this, I think a lot of what came out in this conversation is, um, you know, kind of understanding each other's lived experience and um, sort of laying over, um, you know, a, a crisis that really sort of brings community around the conversation. Um, and theater is is such a community in and of itself. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, especially with, with thinking about the AIDS crisis and just the um, devastating impact it had not only on particular communities, but also on the theater. I'm losing your joke, your, your sound is, is uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Hopefully me, at least. I was, I was just saying that, um, you know, I think that, you know, laying, still can't hear, can't hear you. Oh, maybe it's, oh, you know what's happened. Can you all hear me or no? We can now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, I was so I was I'm just, sorry, I accidentally bumped my volume. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. So said, turn this turn this guy's mic off. Uh, oh. <laughs> no, but I, I mean I think it's I think it's sort of a, a you know a, a perfect um, topic to sort of um, lay over um, theatrical pieces just because it's you know, something that that not only impacted particular communities, but certainly impacted the theater community a lot. So I thought, you know, it was really interesting to kind of think about it from that lens and the the lived experience that a lot of people in the theater community bring to this, this topic as they're uh, both creating and performing. So thank you, Joe. I'm punishing myself by putting myself off screen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> who'd like to go next? I guess I will. I, I want to say, I think that this this is an important conversation. The topic was just a great segue into it. Um, I, I think we could have had this conversation about, you know, civil rights and plays. We could have had this conversation about the idea of love and plays. So at the end of the day, it was, it was a new way to slide into an important conversation. And I hope we can begin to find new ways to, as Joe noted, see each other's perspectives through that dialogue. Because I think too often what I've experienced is people come to the show and go, oh, that was so lovely, and then walk away and never have another conversation about it. Yeah. So I think as a community, maybe we have some responsibility to begin to really ask a little bit more of our audiences to start pushing themselves to yeah. talk about that. That'd be great. That would be great. Yeah, and I don't have much new to say because I think those two things and Joe's earlier point that Todd brought up about being side by side with someone, you know, so I, I do think that's really worth looking at the fact that, you know, we always talk about the community experience, the experience of the actors and, you know, people creating the art have, but also the audience coming in and having a communal experience. And it's easy to forget that each one is also having a very individual experience. That, you know, you're taking away something very unique. And that's one of the things I love about the theater, that it can be a very different experience for me than it is for somebody else. And I think that's what both of you were saying just now. So I'm not really adding much, but um, that would, that's my takeaway, I guess. Thanks, John. Uh, Janet? Well, I, yeah, I, I'm thinking about some things that are kind of contradictory both at the same time. Good. One of them is that, um, well, one of them kind of contradicts something that, that Todd said. He would, you were talking about that, that we're, we're in it so we can't get perspective, you know, in, so, in some sense. But I think that because we're in it and because of the unique nature of um, the pandemic right now, that this is the perfect time to get a perspective, if not the perspective. And so, <laughs> speaking <Someone> of, uh, <laughs> I might have to come back to my comments. Here, let me, well, shush. Well, that's your dog. I thought it was Tots. <laughs> Mine are very yippy dogs. Pieces <laughs> here. Um, that um, th there was something about. Uh, I, 
on a positive note, I think that that uh, it's really exciting to see how starved we are for theater because at various times, including back in the 80s and 90s, we talked about theater being dead. Yeah. And um, it, like everybody is so excited for this Phoenix to rise again. It's just, and, and so talking about it and talking about the conversations we want to have, these are the conversations I want my audience to have. Now, on a process note, I don't necessarily think that, um, and, and maybe this is just an individual thing, that um, I don't necessarily want somebody to do my play and be reading a bunch of stuff or imposing a lens on top of it. I want that to be saved for the audience, you know? Um, and then they, they can do whatever they, they of want. Of course, you know? yeah. But yeah. then again, I have no control because I don't. I don't have control mm -hmm. over anything. But I, I think that there's a lot of exciting things that have come out of this uh, conversation for me about just, just ways we could, um, ways we can talk to each other. So, uh, yeah, I, I think Good. that, oh, there was something else. Mm -hmm. um, like I'm not, I'm not a biblical scholar. I, I actually probably have never read the whole Bible all the way through. Um, but I've read parts of it, and it's it's always interesting. Just like like, and not always interesting, but somebody who really knows their shit about that, and and like loves to talk about it and analyze it, you know, and kind of like read things into it. You're like, mm, no, I don't think that's what it says at all. But that's interesting. And I think that, that it just reminded me of this in, in kind of the same way. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. It, it unlocks things. We were talking about that, so. Um, you're making me want to just share something. Gerardo, Gerardo goes to all kinds of places on the TV um, um, finding series to watch. And he found this French series. It's in English and it's with a, a uh, an English, uh, a, like a, uh, English um, narrator and it's the Greek myths and it's mostly just drawings and, and things with him just telling the stories and it's so complicated and it's so compelling oh my god I mean you're talking about the bible but but the stories that the way this comes off it's like you're hearing history in a way of of something that that actually happened and it's such a convoluted bizarre story and every story has these messages in it that, that he doesn't impose on you you get to find them on your own um, but it, it just made me think of that, and I've been wanting to share it with people, so I did it here. Um, I think you go through Prime Prime Video or something, and then search for Greek myths, you probably find it. Anyway, <laughs> sorry, all over the place. Uh, Melissa, you get to have the last word. Okay. Lucky you. I love, Joe, what you said about spending the afternoon thinking about those plays. I didn't have the afternoon to spend, but I did, I, and I actually thought, gosh, are we going to talk about, like, what about like death of a salesman or, um, I don't know, are we going to try and apply these, these criteria? Mm. I was thinking about two plays, one that Todd was in, and these are plays I love. So I would only have good things to say about them. They were both LCC Black Box shows. And I was trying to think, could these criteria apply to those? One of them uh, was uh, Samuel Beckett's Endgame, mm -hmm. and the other is Simon Stevens' Motor Town. And I don't know, maybe I'm stretching things, but I think the criteria could apply. Todd, we could have a whole long conversation. I'd love to talk with you about it. But but I, I feel like in, in both those plays, there are, there are I mean, in, in Endgame, the threat, yeah, mm -hmm. that not an existential threat. Yeah. And, and, you know, there's there's kind of blaming that, that, that you know, Ham is blaming, Clove is blaming, Nag and Nell are blaming, and they do have a little community that forms. As far as we know, they survive to live another day. So I don't know, I, I, that could be stretching it, but I, I did that and I did that with, with Motortown, which might be more of a stretch because the idea of survival in that, that's a, a dark play, but the, the threat there very much is, is an existential threat because it is about alienation and and the the um how our culture and i read somewhere that simon stevens had written it because he felt guilty about contributing to a culture that that allows alienation and uh uh you know that that a young man comes back from war 
there are no jobs. This is in, in a, a small town, factory town in England. He's, you know, uh, he's a goner uh, mentally and does horrible, violent things. He blames, he certainly doesn't blame himself. Um, and the community is basically him and his brother, maybe a little bit the character you played, Paul. But anyway, so I just, I'm like thinking about that. And so for me, um, just for me personally, and then having a chance to talk and listen, I find this very worthwhile. And I, I think if your audience uh, for the podcast are people also who love theater, who are involved in theater, I think they will, they will find it, they will find it interesting. And coming back to, for me, the, the, you know, does this theme, does this, the idea of every play being an AIDS play have merit? I think um, in the end that there's, there's a heavy weight to that and theater often carries that. And then there's also glory and theater carries that too. Um, glory in the community that comes together to survive. It can be very personal in a play. It can be uh, larger, but I often find that in play. So I, 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 to me, it's worthwhile and it works. And I sure have enjoyed talking with everybody about it. Thanks, Melissa. Uh, yeah, it was. I, I just want to add one little thing that Melissa's comment made me think, and all those brilliant insights is. I'm sure you've all had this experience where after you've done a play, someone is somewhat dismissively, you'll talk about it afterwards and they'll say, oh, you know, it's really made me think. And it, it, you don't really know what to do with that. <laughs> but I think my point was really good. I mean, this, that's kind of what we're talking about, that each person's having a very unique experience. Yeah, yeah. Thanks everybody. Um, I really appreciate your participating in this. Uh, I think I'm proving my theory that any five smart people brought together can uh, create something uh, spontaneous that's, that's valuable and, and you've certainly demonstrated that tonight. Um, so let's all say goodbye. I'll stop Yay. the recording and, uh, and we'll hang on. We'll talk a little afterward. Bye-bye.